Hello. Welcome to the CAA's Columbia at Home series. We're glad you've joined us. I'm Gibson Knott, Senior Director of CAA Marketing and Digital Initiatives. Tonight's program is navigating a job search in a difficult market with a panel comprised of members of the Columbia Career Coaches Network. After the panel discussion, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have. The panel will be moderated by Eric Harwitz. Eric is a graduate of the Columbia College class of 1990 and currently serves as the head coach for the Columbia Career Coaches Network. He is a coach with 15 years experience coaching corporate executives and entrepreneurs. His focus is helping executives design a career and life plan that maximizes their strengths and identifies areas for personal and professional improvement. Eric previously worked as a senior executive in the human resource consulting practice of PricewaterhouseCoopers for 12 years. I'm now pleased to welcome Eric Harwitz to Columbia at Home. Hello. Thank you, Gibson, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Eric Horowitz, and I was uh, the class of 1990 from Columbia College. Thought I'd give a little quick, a quick anecdote to get us started. Uh, when I graduated Columbia in 1990, there was a recession, and I was driving in my car, and I heard on the radio that they had laid off 8,000 people from Citibank. And all I could think to myself was that means there are 8,000 more people looking for the same job that I was. So I was a bit despondent about the state of things, but things uh, uh, worked out pretty well in the end. So uh, there are many times during, during our careers where uh, a big challenge comes our way and uh, we have to face it. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a genesis about the uh, Career Coaching Network. It was actually the, uh, the idea of the Columbia Alumni Association in 2008 during the uh, financial crisis as a way to support Columbia alumni by finding and recruiting uh, professional career coaches to help alumni as they navigate their uh, career searches. And so uh, we've been going strong for about 12 years now and we have 25 uh, excellent coaches within our network that alumni can access as they navigate their, uh, their careers. Just for those of you who may not know what a coach is, a coach is a lot like a coach in sports. So the, a coach in sports helps the team strategize, it thinks about what's going on with the competition, how to win and to define winning, and knowing that in any sport there will be setbacks, and then how do you strategize around those setbacks? And coaching has been around for about uh, 30 years. So um, just to give a little bit of a context within uh, our current uh, COVID situation, I guess I would call it. And um, I, I like to help people think about a little bit, there are areas or functions in the marketplace that were changing significantly before COVID. So for example, changes in fashion and in retail, and for example, let's say the movie industry, they were all going through major shifts before COVID. And now you're seeing significant changes in specific industries because we've gone to uh, a much more virtual situation. And some of these industries may not uh, come out of, out of this situation the same. So when thinking about a career search, one wants to also understand all the, all the larger forces that are going on in the, uh, in the world. So uh, just so you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce and describe all the coaches to you and then they're gonna take it away from there. And then after that, we're gonna have a Q and A. If you have a question, please try to make your question uh, relevant to you, but also relevant to others, so that uh, the answers that we share can apply to as many people as possible. We have a pretty large uh, attendance, so uh, it should, uh, we hope to help as many people as possible. And then if you're interested in getting more detail, you'll be able to reach out to one of the coaches uh, individually through, through the links we're gonna share with you. So uh, first I'd like to introduce uh, Carolyn Siniza Levine. She is a co-founder of Six Figure Start Career Coaching and a longtime recruiter who was hired for tech, media, finance, management consulting, pharma, biotech, and nonprofit. She is a senior consult contributor to Forbes Leadership and frequent media guest on careers in the job market. 
Caroline specializes in career change, helping people discover a new industry or role and make a great living doing work they love. Next, I'd like to also introduce Joshua Spodek, is a three-time TEDx speaker, number one best-selling author of Initiative and Leadership Step-by-Step, Step, host of the award-winning Leadership and Environment podcast, and professor at NYU. He holds a PhD in astrophysics and an MBA from Columbia, where he studied under the Nobel laureate and helped launch a satellite. He left academia to found a venture to market an invention that showed animated images to subway riders between stations. And lastly, Julia Wexler is a Columbia University certified coach and former Wall Street executive search partner for over 15 years. Her specialty is helping professionals navigate their career changes at all level with a particular expertise in the financial services and corporate sectors. She has coached at very senior levels and more recently she has worked with recent graduates on how to brand themselves and market themselves in our COVID environment. So uh, thank you all for joining. And Carolyn, I thought you could start and uh, please share, share with us your philosophy and some, some good tips. So take it away. Sure, yeah. So uh, in terms of coaching philosophy, I co-founded Six Figure Start in 2008 with another recruiter. And our firm is comprised entirely of former Fortune 500 recruiters. That's the approach that we bring uh, to our clients. It's really based on having evaluated thousands of candidates and been involved in so many different um, areas of hiring and recruiting. Uh, myself, I actually trained as a classical pianist and am a multiple time career changer. So I started in music and then went into banking and consulting before moving into HR and starting my own company. And so I've been a career changer myself. I obviously believe in it and love it. And that's what I like to bring uh, to my clients. Do you want to do tips now or we're going to go around and do coaching? No, go classes? ahead and keep going. And okay. Um, so, you know, we were asked to, to share a story of someone who's kind of navigated a down market. And I will say that I have recruited um, post 9-11. I recruited during the dot-com bust. Uh, I recruited after the, the great financial crisis, 2008, 9, 10. So I've recruited in down markets and I know that people get hired. And it doesn't seem that way because a lot of the press is gonna talk about double digit employment, but people absolutely do. And actually a client of mine uh, started her job this week and she had been close to something and then the pandemic happened and everything kind of shut down and she felt like she was starting from scratch, but really she wasn't. She had been working her search. Um, she wanted to reinvent herself. She was a former journalist turned editor and really wanted to leave that space. She's now in the life sciences. Uh, so she made a career change in the pandemic. Um, and make 70% more than she was making as a journalist. So she even got herself a pay bump through it all. So it's, it's definitely uh, something that can happen. Uh, and in terms of just top tips, I would say that in a down market, uh, something to remember is that employers are gun shy about hiring. And so you wanna make it as easy for them as possible. You wanna be enthusiastic because everybody's nervous. Um, about their own jobs. So to the extent that you can be enthusiastic, you can be the calm in the storm, that's super, super helpful. Uh, you want to definitely solve a specific problem because there's no fluff. Uh, everyone's concerned about their budgets and about their headcount. And so you have to be solving a very specific problem and you wanna show that you do and not just say that you do. So show with, with metrics and with very clear examples. Uh, you definitely want to stay in touch and be responsive because hiring uh, is very volatile during times like this. And so you might uh, hear crickets for a little bit and then all of a sudden things are moving again. So, you know, it's not that hiring doesn't happen, but there's definitely a different ebb and flow. And then I would say, you know, certainly be opportunistic, be willing to look at a wide variety of opportunities. Don't be so quick uh, to judge an opportunity. Many times the job posting is wrong or it's incomplete and you want to get in there and learn about the company and learn about the role before making, you know, really any decisions about whether or not you can see yourself there. So, so Car thank you, Carolyn. So you're saying through all the other downturns, you've always seen hiring continues. 
Absolutely. And I've seen people able to make career changes during, right. during these downturns. So I think that, that you need to keep that, that optimism. And I don't mean to be Pollyanna about it. I mean, certainly there's, there's, uh, you know, again, I said employers are gun shy. They're concerned about their budget. So they're not just going to be hiring willy nilly, but it's important to remember that there is hiring and that being proactive with your search and continuing with the networking, working mm -hmm. on your branding, resume, LinkedIn, cover letter, networking pitch, doing all of those things uh, is going to help you having multiple leads in play, being responsive, et cetera. I think, Carolyn, the thing that I took away from what you were saying also was people that if you're in the middle of the search, you've been doing the work. So it's not as though you're starting over. You know, you've been doing the work and that can pay off. So it's not like you're really starting. Yeah, especially if you have those multiple leads in play. Sometimes I've seen people who uh, they start something and, and very quickly they're called in by a company and then they only focus on that company. I wouldn't call that a job search, I'd call that kind of a start and stop because if that disappears, you've got nothing else in the pipeline. So when I was telling the story about Hannah who made that switch from media into life sciences, she was keeping in touch with a lot of people. She was also working on some freelancing. So she felt like she had some cash flow coming in to keep her search going and not have to jump at, at the very next thing. So she was putting in a lot of different pieces and not just focusing on any one employer. And that really helped her because as I mentioned, she was close to something and, and then COVID happened and, and every, everything was frozen with that one company. But because she had other leads in the fire, she was very able uh, to quickly pick up and continue her search. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Joshua, you're up, you ready? Yeah, and if there's a bit of thunder and lightning, I, I keep thinking, it reminds me of something from Lit Hum, and I'm trying to figure out if it's more like the Iliad or if it's the Bible, but I think it's their eyes are watching God. But if you see lights flickering, that's why. Uh, and so when I left Columbia, I had a degree in physics and I started, uh, as Eric mentioned, my, my first company. And in the late 90s, it did really, we did really well. And next thing you know, we were operating in four continents and, uh, and then all at once, 9-11 happened. My business got completely destroyed. I mean, the whole industry was, was nothing could happen. And there was very little opportunity for funding. And so suddenly I was stuck. And my degree was not useful in the field that I was in. So the connections that I had weren't worth anything, uh, professionally speaking. And I felt suddenly I'd worked so hard to build something. All of, and then I left that for something else that I worked hard to build. And then I had really felt like I had nothing. And so entrepreneurship got me into, uh, out of, out of uh, academia. I wasn't really sure what to do. And over the years, I've started more and more companies and started, eventually started to teach leadership and entrepreneurship. And I started to teach people how to do what I did. And what I noticed was that I didn't teach uh, lecture, I taught inquiry-driven project-based learning where people are actually doing things out with people in the world. And what really hit me was when one of my students came back to me and said, I work at this company part-time, and they said that I'm at the top position that's available for someone without a college degree. But the projects that I'm doing for this class are so, they, they don't know that he's doing it, but he's telling me that they liked what I'm doing so much, they were afraid of me leaving to another firm. So they created a new position, higher than what I have now, but below what you can get the limit for not having a college degree. And we've promoted you to this new position. And this has evolved into the niche that I have when I coach people on, on um, looking for new work is the, is to solve a problem. It, it's two things. One is to solve a problem as Carolyn was talking about a specific problem and to present yourself as a problem solver. And the other is, to, is I bring people in so that you can connect with people at the highest levels because when people see you as a problem solver, working on a problem that's relevant to them, they don't want you solving little problems. They want you solving big problems. And so they, they're gonna, you're gonna be able to connect with the top people. Then if you come in and say, I'd like an informational interview, I wonder if I could talk to someone there. They'll say, talk to HR. Not the worst thing in the world. But if you come in and say, I'm working on this problem and I wonder if, uh, could I talk to the CEO, they're an expert, and I think that their views would be useful. If you really are solving a problem, not just saying, in a generality, like I just said, they will often take your call. And that's what I do. I help people work with people at the highest level of a, 
of a field that they want to start going into. So an example I have is that um, this guy, Jonathan, once came to me and he was employed as a lawyer at the time and uh, got a degree at Penn. Loved, he didn't love law. In fact, he didn't really like what he was doing at all. And he felt there was no room for advancement. There was no room for him to do anything except what he was doing. And he really didn't like it. I started him working on a project. I said, what's something that you can do to build value in a community that you care about? And we worked on some of the details. And it turns out that um, bankruptcy was something important to him. So bankruptcy is a very important thing. If, uh, if you don't have it, capitalism doesn't really work that well. And it's become more and more and more expensive for people to declare bankruptcy. And so he figured out a way to make it much cheaper. Next thing you know, that connects him to someone at Harvard who's working on something uh, similar. And they decide to take something that Jonathan was going to do one-on-one -on -one, and they take it online. Next thing you know, they got funded by Harvard. Next thing you know, because of coming to people with, I'm solving this problem for this community, Mark Zuckerberg um, funded them, as did Eric Schmidt. And now, as it happened, then he got into Y Combinator and it started this company. But the, the point in this case is not that he started a company, although he did. It's that he was solving a problem that was very specific that people could figure out that's something that helps my community. That's something that I can support. And so when he would talk to people, they would put him in touch with other people. A lot of people, when they say, here's how to meet people in a, in a field you want to work in, I think a common suggestion is to volunteer somewhere. Uh, and another one is often to start a company in a field. And somewhere in between that is to solve a problem that's useful, but not necessarily going to start a company. And this often will lead you to make connections where people want to meet you. And if you do it effectively, where you start first with friends and family and getting advice from them, then you start branching into people in the field and you start branching into people who are um, more in the field. By the time you reach the people who are more in the field, they hear that you've solved this problem in a, in a rudimentary way and they, they wanna help you. And so I coach people through how to solve a problem. And you don't need me as a coach. You can find a problem in an area that you wanna go into, figure out a way to work on it and start going to people and asking them for advice on how to solve this problem. And you'll be amazed at how this opens doors. My podcast has emerged from this myself. And if you look at the guests that I've had on my podcast, there's like the three-time global managing director of McKinsey, an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, there's a Super Bowl winner and, and plenty of, of number one New York Times bestselling authors. It's not that hard to do. Some of the, like some of the things that you can do to add value in a community, one of the big ones that happens, works really well is to host a panel like this one right here, right now. The hosts of this one, you might not, you might guess this, the number of contact between them and us is very high to make sure that it runs very well. And they're making sure that it runs very well. If you were to host a panel in a community that mattered to you, if you want to have four panelists, you got to make 40 contacts for people because most of them can't make it. But you know, each time you talk to someone, if you say, I'm doing this panel, you'd be a great person to be on the panel. I wonder if you'd hear what I'm doing. A lot of people say yes. You can make it very efficient, which is what a lot of people do. But you can also just talk to them and share what your goals are, what your aims are with making this panel. It could be a CEO roundtable discussion. It could be starting a podcast. It opens doors for people, or people open their doors for you. And you'll be amazed at the type of people that you can get that might not open the doors to you otherwise when you're solving a problem. Um, Joshua, can I ask a question? Do you think now it's a lot easier to, during COVID to create these type of panels or people more open towards these kinds of things? Or? Yeah, because now the costs go down a lot because you don't have to get a room. You don't have to put everyone in one place and you can do it online. <laughs> and to get them, I mean, you want to be able to fill a room, but mm -hmm. it used to be to actually physically get people there and to get the room was a huge hurdle. That's not there anymore. And, and the other thing I think I heard you say, which sounds uh, really important is like being a great problem solver. And at this stage, if you read the, the news or what's going on in the world, there are so many problems to solve. Oh man, I was on a panel a little while ago and one of the guys was talking about how his son or daughter goes to this Upper East Side school and yeah. every summer they have to do some service-based project. And they were complaining that they, a lot of other parents were complaining that their kids couldn't do it because what could they do now? I'm thinking there are more problems than ever. This is a bet. This is, it's a greater time to solve problems. There's more access. There's more people who could use your help. 
So now is there's a lot of there's a there's lot of a lot of problems to solve right now. Right, right. One thing I heard recently was like how to figure out how many people can get in the, uh, in an elevator at any given moment. So like there's just so many problems to solve. Yeah, it's and the people who are at home and could use support for doing lots of different things. It's there's so much to do. Thank you, Joshua. All right, Julia. Hi Hello. everyone. Hello. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, quick laser focused bio. Um, I graduated Columbia with a degree in psychology and landed on Wall Street not knowing a thing about business and helping people get jobs as an executive search professional, became a partner, then went back to Columbia for my advanced coaching certification because all I ever wanted to do was help people solve their problems and then became an executive coach and then reinvented again, working currently for a college and helping recent grads get jobs in this market. So I've coached Wall Street, very, very, very top professionals and very recent grads. And so what I'm gonna condense is the three decades of patterns that differentiate those who get jobs from those who continually stumble. And one of the most important things to think about is um, and Josh touched on this and Caroline did as well. A resume is meant to show someone what you made happen and to minimize risk. That's why you went to whatever school and got whatever GPA. That's why you'll have more results if you get a 3.9 than a 1.9. We all know this because no one has time to get to know you. We have even less time now when a computer is looking for search words on your resume before they even think about booting it to a human professional. So minimizing the risk to an employer differentiates those who get the interview and eventually land the job. The second part is focusing on their agenda versus yours. Particularly students come to me all the time and I'm nervous and I don't know this and what about that and this and this and I need to know and I say to them, What's the problem that you're solving for this employer? And how do you communicate that to the employer? No one wants to interview someone for a job. It's a pain in the neck, they're busy, they don't have a lot of time. If you can be the candidate that very quickly delivers the fact that I am your low risk hire, I can get this job done for you and I can save you trouble and I can solve your problem. We've all said this, but it's solving a problem that's very important. Being authentic is something else. Knowing yourself and not being afraid to say, I really hate doing this, but I'm going to do it because it's a backdoor into something else almost never works. Having, you know, had three decades in this and reinvented and coached people from every walk of life. Be who you are. And if you aren't sure who you are professionally, figure it out. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are you amazing at? And at the end of the day, every interview is really asking you one thing, what did you make happen? My favorite new interview question, all the employers are asking it, what did you do during the pandemic? And trust me, watching video games versus teaching myself three coding languages is a pretty big continuum. People are home now, which means you can have virtual coffee chats with anyone all the time. You have an amazing Columbia network of alumni who if you link in correctly, right? And not stalk them, but link in and say, I just saw this job at your firm. Here's my resume. I would like to know the answer to this question. Don't link in and say, here's my resume. I have no idea what to do with my life. Can you tell me? And I'm being obviously, it, just to belabor the obvious, if you make it easy for people to help you, they love to help. If you make it onerous, no one has time. But this market presents some unbelievable opportunities as well as challenges. You are the generation coming out now. You are all looking for jobs now. This is a challenging time, but people are home. And for every market cycle, I mean, the businesses that formed in the last few recessions, I'll point to Google, Facebook, they all formed in recessions. Tesla, Netflix, Airbnb, Trader Joe's, Microsoft, take advantage of opportunity and challenges, as everyone knows, make you smarter because nothing's easy. And if you can say, 
okay, here's, the, here's what I was handed. My business went away. My profession is no longer accurate. I was in publishing. I mean, I've heard it all. Professions that are just completely gone. Don't forget, guys, others are opening. And so if you can really not just write on your resume that you are adaptable and tenacious and persistent and resilient, but show in those interviews. I was headed for this career path and I had to readjust. My dream was here and I had to change my dream. I had to be flexible and think about another career path, all the while having a very strong sense of the fact that I'm great with A, B, and C. I just segued, shifted, pivoted, and took those core skills into a market where, guess what? They were hiring, so I got a better job and I moved up there. Um, the other point is, you're in the work world for 40 years. If you think you're not going to transition, don't feel bad, don't feel like you have to apologize. No one wants to do the same job from when they graduate B-School at 26 for the next 40 years. So the good news is everyone has to change. It, it happens to you. Be ahead of it by being very smart and taking stock of the skills, what I call the professional identity that you have so that you can communicate it clearly to employers, help them solve their problem, focus on their agenda. Um, and those are the people that I'm seeing, even in this market, to do very well with their jobs. Thank you. One thing I heard you say, which I know comes up a lot, is this uh, make sure you are giving the employer the benefit that they need. Is there a way you help people understand that that's really the most important thing because the employer is the payer? I always say focus on their agenda and don't go into any interview unless you know exactly what that interviewer needs and exactly what problem you're solving, which means it's easy nowadays, guys. Everything's online. You go for a job, you look at the skills, you go online and you see who else at that company has that job of financial analyst, planner, project manager. You look at the skills, you look where they came from. And when you're in an interview, if you don't ask questions, you'll never get the job. The questions that you ask should focus on the agenda of the employer. You know, in your eyes, what would I be able to do that would help you in this job? What did the person before me do right and wrong? Not how much vacation do I have a parking spot, obviously. But sometimes people don't realize that the more the interviewer talks in the interview, the higher the percentage and the higher the chances that you'll get the job. They uh, thought that person was great. They spoke the whole time. <laughs> you asked questions, go in an interview and, and say, oh, there's pictures in their office. Oh, do you have children? I see you play hockey. Do you like the Rangers? As you know, people hire people that they want to hang out with travel with, have cocktails with, well, used to travel with, <laughs> be on virtual Zoom sessions with. I thought about traveling with. <laughs> um, but the whole point is uh, the most qualified candidate doesn't always get the job. The most likable and qualified candidate always gets the job. I've seen, I've noticed. So Julia, from that, well, you mentioned a lot about being authentic. Do you have any thoughts about being authentic during this pandemic in terms of how much to share or how to share whatever struggles or reality you're going through during this time? It's really important to only share things that are relevant to the job and the skills that you're demonstrating. Everything in the interview should be another chance. You don't know how long the interview will be to hit another point about why you're great for the job. So when you're authentic about you know, this market took me by surprise. It did all of us. I had everything lined up in a row. Now things are different. So I have pivoted and learned three new coding languages and blah, blah, blah. All of those things. The other little tidbit and the free coaching is when you write that thank you email that everyone writes, don't write the same. Thanks so much. I enjoyed meeting you. Thanks for the time. Let me know what else can be done. Use that thank you as another opportunity to convey something you didn't get to bring up about your candidacy and your strengths based on what you listened to and what you heard that you didn't know prior to the interview. That helps differentiate people quite a bit. You know, I was thinking about what you said and I looked at this article and I wanted to share it with you, whatever. Mm -hmm. Show that you are already working and listening and helping out the employer. 
So, so I guess I would say the distinction you made about authentic, it's not like, you know, I'm really depressed and I've been in bed for three months and I've been eating and I'm really worried. I'm authentic about my skill set, but still professional in my delivery. Yeah, it's um, very important to stay professional no matter what. No one wants someone from the outset who's going to require caretaking. Uh, I hate to say it, emotionally or any other way, people are too busy. And you might be great, but the other candidate wasn't so much high, wasn't so high maintenance. So guess who's going to get the job? So make That's it easy. the reality. What's that? Make it easy. Exactly. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Okay. Sure. We're, we're going to start with our questions. We have several questions in the Q&A and we got some earlier questions. So I'm going to start with some of the earlier questions. Uh, uh, Carol, Caroline, I'm going to start with you. Um, what tips can you give to older job seekers and how do you handle ageism? Uh, I think you're, you're muted. I think we have to unmute. Caroline, um, you're muted. Yeah. I think she can unmute herself. Yeah, I, I did. Okay. There Thanks so much. So yeah, yeah I, I posted on, on Forbes, maybe it's two or three posts ago, job search tips over 50. So I'll just defer to that. Uh, but in a nutshell, I mean, I think that you need to think about, um, again, it, to, to, I think to Julie's point around serving the other agenda. So what might they be concerned about regarding your candidacy that um, you might think you're overqualified for the job, that you might be too expensive, um, that you, um, depending on if you've been out of the workforce, that you might be out of touch with um, either the processes or the systems or the culture or all of it. And so you want to be thinking about what might be some of those hesitations and, and work around those. And then I would use what some of your strengths are. So uh, job seekers over 50 have the perspective. I mean, you've worked in a number of different markets, in up and down markets, in growth markets, in shrinking markets. You've worked for uh, different kinds of companies. So I would use that perspective uh, and I would, I would specifically talk about, you know, what you've learned over the years and why your additional experience is going to be valuable. The other thing about being an older worker is that hopefully you have a, a larger network at this point and so that you can tap that network because the reality is, is that a lot of jobs uh, aren't posted um, and that you really want to be uh, talking to people around what they need uh, because you want to be one of the first people to hear about uh, that a job or that an opportunity is is taking shape. Okay, uh, great. Um, Josh, this is the question. How and where do I start searching after a break due to health reasons coming out of retirement or extended maternity leave, et cetera? So what happens if I'm starting over or starting from scratch? Yeah, if you're starting from scratch, that's exactly the situation where if you can do something to build community. I mean, really, the top thing I think of is, is to do, if you were to do a panel like this, you, the steps are to figure out what's something that's an interesting topic for people in that field that's interesting to me. And then contact, you can contact 20 or 30 people and say, I'm doing a panel. I'm looking to have four people on the panel and you're an expert. I wonder if you'd take my call to tell, for me to tell you what the what we're going to talk about and if you could do it. Now, many will say no, but many will say yes. And you can talk to them and tell them what you're doing. And one of the things to say, the more that you say, say, this is what I'm trying to do, the more that they will also tell you this is what they're trying to do. Oftentimes they'll say, you know, here are some problems that, that I see in my area. Now there's a technical term in business when someone who is a valuable person in a field shares their problems. The technical term for when a, a valuable person in a field shares their problems is job offer. When they tell you what's, what their problems are, if you know how to respond to that, you know, to say, oh, that's something I'm good at. You know, if I, if you give me, can you give me a week to think about this? I think I can help solve that problem. Then you can probably get a connection with them and have an ongoing conversation. If you have something like a, a, a panel like this to, that you're scheduling, you can do that 20 or 30 or 40 times. And in fact, if you look at my books, you'll see that I have a bunch of uh, Harvard professors that have written blurbs for my books. That was because I met them 
scheduling a panel that has actually never happened. I just kept working and working and making it happen, but I kept meeting and meeting more people and made all these connections. The fact that it never happened, no one ever came back to me and said, whatever happened with that panel? They, we just have great relationships. And this way, you form relationships with people and they see you as someone who's doing something not, so, and, and by the way, you don't have to pay anything for this. It will take time, but the time, most of the time is talking to high level people, but it really doesn't have to cost a penny. I mean, it used to, you have to rent a place, but now you don't have to do that. That's my top level thing. If you're higher level, if you've been in the industry before, you could do a CEO round table, which doesn't involve inviting people. It could just be getting high level people to talk to each other. And so there's various different things that you can do, but something where you're building community and adding value to it. It so, shows your interest. It shows your, your intent. It shows your capability. So it sounds as though before you go and send out your, uh, your resume, you start to build the community around what it is you're interested in. Is that, is that, is that a good synopsis? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, Julia. It's, this is sort of like one of those game shows, right? You never know what question you're going to get. Number three. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. Okay. Um, in non-pandemic times, it was the kiss of death to look for work in July and August. Is this true yeah. now? The short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is since there are less opportunities, take a look at the employment numbers, um, the best defense is an overly aggressive offense, which means you need to get out there and get your resume out there and be aggressive as heck um, and show that you're ahead of the game. There is no reason to wait in a down market when people are predicting a recession in the third quarter and fourth quarter. You don't want to wait until it might get worse. People aren't assuring me it's getting better. I don't know if you're hearing some great economic news, but I haven't heard that on any channel and I hear them all. So do not wait at all. Um, there are industries that are absolutely, because of the pandemic, still hiring and still booming. Um, most aren't, but many are as a result of the pandemic. LinkedIn has hashtag we are hiring. There's coronavirus hiring now. There's all kinds of hashtags. And so there's, from an employer's point of view, no excuse why people aren't actively investigating, researching, being proactive about finding the industries that are hiring now, the companies in those industries, what are the positions that match up with my background or don't match up, but segue a little. And then something else, it's a great time to learn something new and say, you know what? Particularly, there were a lot of questions in the chat about um, post 50 in the workplace, right? So if you don't know some things technically, there's a million free classes, right? Two people I know in the downtime taught themselves Python, taught themselves JavaScript, right? I'm just trying to teach myself to get better with Excel, but mm -hmm. learn something. So you can say, yes, I no longer, oh, I can't check that box. I don't know that and it's on every job. If, if a skill is being asked for in every job and you don't have it, go learn it, right? Lifelong learning, that's what we teach at Columbia. That's what we, it's a great opportunity to learn, add skills to your repertoire and become more marketable in the process. Uh, that's, that's great, Julia. Something to add or something I've been thinking about is like August was when everybody went on vacation, but August isn't August the way August used to be. So a lot of the old patterns may not be true anymore. People are just moving from their living room to the kitchen finally. <laughs> yeah, and maybe to the pool if it's opened in the backyard, but right. it's a different, it's a new world. So the rules don't apply. And most importantly, if you're looking for a job and you need a job, don't wait. There's just uh, no reason to wait. Excellent. Um, okay, next. Uh, uh, so Car Caroline, um, can you give some guidance for candidates who've been away from the job market for a long time when there is a gap? Do you recommend being honest about the situation, having raised children or a family situation, et cetera? I think the most important thing to talk about is what you've done that's relevant to the employer. It really is about solving that problem. Um, and I, you know, I coached someone who was out of the workforce for 20 years. It was pretty clear that it was, she was a stay at home mom and raised three children. Before that she had been in sales and 
in the last year, in the run up to before she went on the market, uh, she started to get uh, much more involved in uh, community service uh, on different committees. She started to do some fundraising, which was tied into her sales. And that's what we focused on. We focused on all of those accomplishments in that area. And we also focused on what she was interested in doing specifically. She had uh, grown an interest in personal finance. She ended up working for a wealth manager and a uh, wealth management firm. And part of, of making that bridge wasn't just kind of the obvious, okay, she's got some great client service and she did have a sales background, but it was also, she learned about that industry. So she was, was genuinely interested in the industry. It was clear that she was enthusiastic. She knew about who the big players were in her geographic area. And so she knew how to talk to them. And that's been true really of everybody who's made a change and, and, Make no mistake, being an on-ramper, so when you've had a gap of one, two, five, 10, 20 years, you're making a career change from whatever you've done before to what you're doing now. But what employers care about is what you're doing now because that's what they're doing and that's where their problems are. I also think it's true now people are more open to gaps without that whole idea like, if you had a gap, you always have to explain the gap, but yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, I obviously think it, it takes practice to talk about, you know, why you were away, especially uh, in situations where perhaps there's some emotion tied to it. Maybe it was not a happy occasion, a medical issue or a loss in the family. And so, you know, that's something that only you can know is that you need to practice in terms of uh, talking about a time in your life. And I don't recommend that you have to give uh, any sort of explanation about why you were gone. You can say that it was a, a leave of absence, a family issue solved, and here I am. And again, then take the conversation to the present, what you've been doing, what you've been learning, everything you know about the company, how excited you are about X, Y, Z, and the more specific you can be, the more genuine and enthusiastic and qualified you're going to sound. And, and something that one does with one's coach is practice those communications so that you nail those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Doing mock interviews, uh, having them recorded, listening back to them. Uh, so you can hear, I don't have to say to my clients, this is what you sound like. They can hear it. They can see it on a recorded video. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely all of it's practice. That's good. Um, okay, Joshua, the question for you. Are you seeing an increase in hiring professionals who do not live in the same state or even country now that most prof professional people are working from home. So, I mean, maybe just generally, what do you think about the, the future in that arena? Yeah, I can't say what I actually see in that area, but uh, from personal seeing, there's certainly a lot more working from home and certainly a lot more remote working. Uh, yeah, I was just listening to a podcast with the guy who runs Slack. Mm -hmm. And they have no plans. I mean, they're, actually, there are a lot of places now that are starting that have no plans of having a physical workplace. Uh, and there are a lot of places that are, I was talking to this one guy, and their company, they have to pay, a, I don't know what the rent is, a high rent for an office that they simply can't use. Right. And so that gives them the freedom to, I mean, they have this huge albatross of having to pay this money, but they have this freedom to hire people from wherever they want in the world. The possibility is certainly there. And growing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, growing a lot. The tools of, all the tools, the Zooms and the Slacks and all these things are making it more and more possible. So, yeah, and being familiar with and, and fluent in those things, I presume most people are, but if you're not, become fluent in them. Be able to work remotely. Be able to handle going across time zones. Be able to handle um, that people are going to, you know, there are going to be various different media that people are going to be communicating through and you have to be able to coordinate these things. If you can do those things, then they don't have to worry about you figuring out how to do that. So it can be an asset to not consider location as a main issue like it used to be potentially in the future. There certainly are a lot of places that are saying we simply don't want that. Mm -hmm. we, it's, it's not necessary for us and we'd rather have people working as however they want. Right. Yeah, when I uh, work with CFOs, there's a lot of looking at the bottom line around the amount they spend on space 
and realizing they could save a lot of money on space, ergo invest in people more than space. So that's definitely a trend. Yeah, that said, a lot of people don't like that. They like to work in places. Yes. That's just shaking out. I'm, I'm not sure what to say about that. Right. We're it's early days. Four or five months in may yeah. sound like a long time to be locked up, but right. it's very short in terms of seeing workplace trends like that, I believe. I agree. Um, okay. Um, Julia, I, I had, here's the, here's the, I had two final rounds recently and did not receive an offer. My feedback was, you're a great fit. They loved you and we have no feedback. We went with someone a few more years. What is your advice on bouncing back and not being discouraged? They went with someone a few more years of experience, I'm guessing. Yeah, they they I... said you were a great fit. They loved you. They had no okay. feedback, but they went with somebody with more experience. Okay, so here's the thing. Yeah. Your headspace. People go in to a job, and I ask my clients all the time, so do you expect to be getting the offer? And it's really important to check your own thoughts and think, I'm expecting to get this offer, so I'm in a final round. It's a complete failure. If I'm one of two and I get to be one of two and I don't get it, more of a colossal failure. And I challenge that. I don't believe that's a failure. I do believe you have to keep on working and that feedback is what you've received. You can take it to say, I'm doing many things right. At the end of the day, if they liked someone better because of whatever, you can't control that, nor should you let it. You can control that it trips you up. You can control that it gets in your head and it starts saying, I knew it, I knew it, I knew I wasn't gonna have this happen. What I call the itty bitty shitty committee in your head. <laughs> And everyone knows it and everyone laughs when I talk about it coaching. Do not allow that. You have control over the failure that you're thinking. You also can change that and say, I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. I'm going to keep knocking at these doors. I'm getting closer and closer every time. Which scenario are you going to play out in your head? Think about the feedback. Think about what you did that you can keep doing better. I tell so many clients this. You're getting closer. Eventually it does happen but also many give up. And that's what you have to not do right before it's about to happen. So it's just a matter of staying um, persistent and being tenacious and knowing, okay, maybe that wasn't the right job for me. Maybe that person didn't like me and maybe I would hate working for them and they disguised it. Who knows? You're not controlling it, but you can control that you can move forward and get going again. So yes, yeah, Julia, sometimes people come to me and they always fail on the third the final interview so i say to them let's look at that as a problem to solve yes right yes and yes oftentimes what i find is that they're non-committal in that last interview and i explain like when you get to the last interview they're looking for you to maybe say absolutely yes and they're going to go with the candidate that says yes not the one who's not sure let me just take that down you know um Employers have feelings, and this gets personal at the end, particularly in the final negotiations and closing phase of an offer when money's discussed or this or that. And the candidate that makes it very clear, I really want to work here. I am going to do the best job. This is so important to me. And if you give me an offer in my range, you can count on me. I am going to be here and stands up, shakes their hand, even in this market, maybe not. But Let's the employer know, my first point, minimizes the risk. You have no risk with me. I can do the job. I want to do the job. I'm not going to be a problem. And I can start tomorrow. Take no problems with me. Here I am. Hire me. If there's a pattern and you are always getting to the final round and never getting the job, that is a pattern that you need to look at and analyze and figure out like any pattern. Something's up and you need to figure it out for sure. Thank you. Uh, we got one more question for each of you. Uh, Carolyn, this one's directed to you. Uh, how can one portray what you're doing now in your resume in order to get noticed by an employer? So I was a multiple time career changer and I was also a recruiter for over 20 years. And I tell all of my career change clients that as a recruiter, I would never hire myself, not from a resume. So career changers don't get hired from resumes. Resumes are a backward looking document. They're probably the least important document uh, for a career change. And I mean that really. 
uh, unlike let's say LinkedIn, which also of course has your chronology, there's a lot more flexibility uh, to LinkedIn. There's the social networking component. Uh, so you can be posting, you can be commenting, you can really uh, guide the reader into seeing you as an expert or at least a curator on different topics and not necessarily what you've done. Very, very difficult to do that on the resume. Maybe you can do that in your executive summary, uh, but, but really it's structured in such a way that it's a backward looking document. So it's not about getting some recruiter to pick your resume out of the pile as a career changer. A career changer essentially needs to embody the change. They become the job that they say they want to do. And the only thing that's keeping them from the career change is a permanent full-time paying job in that area. They already know the people, they already know the trends, they already know the companies are already doing the work. That's how all of my clients have made their career changes. They just do it volunteer or pro bono or on a project basis or something like that. So resume, not going to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joshua, um, this one's a bit of a I'm still in work question, but it goes to your discussion around solving problems. I'm currently employed, but in a difficult management situation. How would you suggest being proactive with my managers about how I can help them solve their problems when they don't set goals and share what they want from my team? The, the main thing is you have to propose to, a lot of times people say, here's, here's a solution for the problem. More important, if, the, if you, a lot of times people will say, I want to get advanced. So I want to propose to them, here's something that I can do for the company. Uh, would you consider me for promotion? Mm -hmm. Much more useful. The, what, what they effectively see is here's an offer, take it or leave it. You, hopefully people don't do it quite so black and white as that. What's much more effective is to keep asking the questions to describe the problem and to, now if you say what problems are, to the sol are there to solve, a lot of times they won't answer. The, the, you still have to ask. The key is not the question. The key is when they respond to, re to s respond back in a supportive non-judgmental way so that they will feel comfortable sharing their problems with you. Oftentimes people feel vulnerable when they share what a problem is. And they feel like if I don't, if, if I say what a problem is, then maybe all my job security gets lower. Maybe that makes me vulnerable. If you speak in a supportive, non-judgmental way, they actually do generally want to share their problems if they know that it's not going to make their life worse, if they're not going to be judged for it, if they're not going to be ridiculed for it, if they're not going to be made fun of for it or lose their job for it. Even if you're someone who report, if, even if there's someone that you report to. Right. So that response of being supportive, non-judgmental, asking confirmation, clarification questions, they will at some point start opening up. And oftentimes they, like their, their body language will change. They'll go from being like, look, th 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 there's nothing for me to share, or share. And at some point they'll be like, you know, I've been trying to get this thing done and I can't figure out how to do it. And oh. they'll, they'll, they'll open up. And that support non-judgment, that is what I find opens people up. It's not that they don't have problems. They're, they don't, they have problems. Hmm. is am I going to risk, am I taking risk to share it? How vulnerable do I want to be? Am I going to be supported if I share this? Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, Julia, you're going to have to have a quick answer to this one question, the lightning round. Yeah. Uh, do you have any suggestion for recent grads who are hired looking for work, but whose start dates are pushed back due to COVID? Yeah, do something in the interim. You've got a job, be thrilled, okay? <laughs> Look, go into that job and think about the skills that are necessary in that job that you don't really have yet so that you can hit the ground running. This happened with three coaching clients of mine. They've got jobs in tech consulting starting in September, pushed off till January. They started getting more technology under their belt. They started researching who else is working there, having coffee chats with them. Tell me about the role. How is it changing due to COVID? Which managers might I have small coffee chats with? to help with, you know, what is the career path you're thinking about now? How can I do a better job now? And since this came out a lot in the questions, I just wanted to throw in um, virtual interviews are a big, big, big deal. It is very, very easy to Google top 10 behavioral interview questions. I'm putting it in the chat. Top 10 behavioral interview questions. Practice them and know how to answer the question in virtual time 
you know, oh, you're walking, oh, so how many tennis balls do you think would fit in this office space? The questions that have no answers because they want to see how you think um, and make sure you're dressed appropriately, which means have bottoms that aren't pajamas. <laughs> I've seen everything and so have employers, but don't let your top job be the first virtual interview that you're doing online with the lawn mowing and the hair blowing and the cat flying around. Really get good at that because it makes a huge difference. Videotape yourself. It's a new world. You can fight it and say they shouldn't be doing that. They are. So you've got to move with the times and be really um, prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, so I wanted to thank Carolyn and Joshua and Julia for sharing all your wonderful tips and ideas. Uh, as, as I said in the beginning, we have a Columbia Career Coaching Network, which offers coaching to all Columbia alumni from all the schools. Um, these are all private coaches uh, who provide their services, who've been through our uh, vetting system and been able to offer coaching to you. So, you know, please, uh, you'll share the link and you can reach out to any of the coaches and uh, find out what they do and how they do it. Um, I would say we had over a hundred questions and I think we got to about 10 of them or 15 of them at the most. So there's a lot of questions there and the purpose of the, uh, of the, coaching uh, career coaches is to really help you navigate this, uh, which was an already interesting and fascinating experience, which has now been multiplied by 100 in, in its interestingness and opportunity. So um, I also want to thank all the people from the CAA who helped put all this together and for everybody who took an hour of their life to share and to learn and continue to grow. So uh, thank you very, thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us and we will follow up with you soon. Thank you.